I see some faces on the screen, a few here and there. Other names, I'm glad you're tuning in. As you know, this is a kind of sort of a hybrid uh, conference in the sense that messages one and three are given like in person right now. We're in different time zones, but other than that, we are all together uh, joined in one. And also message three tomorrow at the same time. And then I pre-recorded messages two and four. And I mentioned this because it's been several days up to almost two weeks for one of them. I don't remember everything I said in giving those two messages. And so at the beginning of message one, I, I may uh, share something that you'll find uh, in message message two. I don't think it will hurt you to hear it again, but I'm just letting you know in a kind of pleasant way uh, how it could be that way. The, the general subject, living in the divine and mystical realm of the compound spirit. Now, this is quite a deep, mysterious, mystical subject. And it may be, and if so, it's not wrong, and it's not a problem to me. It may be that some may be wondering what a mysterious high aspect of the divine revelation in the midst of this present situation we're all in. We might be nearing the end of the latest COVID, but there's all kinds of lawlessness and ungodliness and violence throughout the country. We're all fully aware and deeply touched what's happening in uh, Eastern Europe. And so I want to uh, lay a foundation here for the burden underlying not only message one, but all the messages. And I begin this way. I suggest that when you have the opportunity and if you are inclined to do so, to carefully read Matthew 24, verses 37 through 44. This portion of the word has been in my heart for many, many months. And I've even given some messages focused on it. And there's two main parts there to those messages. The first, the Lord Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming, the parousia of the coming of the Son of Man coming. And in Moses' time, they were warned. Moses, uh, in, in Noah's time, they were warned Noah was preaching righteousness to them as he was building the ark. But they just went on as if life would never, never end. Buying and selling, getting married, giving in marriage, until the flood came and they were all destroyed. And one characteristic emphasized in Genesis 6 of that age was violence. <clears throat> and those of us, there's some advantages to being older if your memory is keen. 
You can look back even to the 60s or other times. There is no period in my lifetime in the United States where there's been violence like there is now. Lawlessness. What kind of evil things are being taught in the public schools in California concerning male and female, gender? And I don't dare say that we are now in the final period of time. I sincerely believe, just as your brother, no more, no less, that we are approaching the end of this age, the age of grace, the age of the church, the age of mystery, and the age of faith. There are indicators in certain parts of the earth, especially in Europe, and the condition in our own country that there's some reason to believe that we are approaching this time. And after the Lord spoke about this, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be, he went on to say, at that time, meaning the time in which we're living, that is very similar, maybe actually even worse in some ways, than the days of Noah. At that time, two men were in the field laboring. One was taken and the other left. Two women were grinding at the mill. One was taken, the other left. And based upon some of the words the Lord used in uh, verses 43 and 44, that these two men were believers. These two women were believers. And one man, that is one brother, was taken, was raptured. The other was not. One woman, that is one sister, was taken by rapture. The other was not. Why? The Lord is not in any way prejudiced, biased. There's two main reasons why. These were two living overcomers that were raptured along with the many mentioned in Revelation 14. They're the first fruits, the living overcomers. And they were raptured just before the great tribulation begins. And so they were, what were they doing? The Lord didn't say that they were pray reading. Uh, they were having a Bible study. They were living another normal, typical day that all us human beings have to live. Working, taking care of responsibilities, taking care of our family, fulfilling the, government, the requirements of government, whatever it is. And so you have two brothers and their jobs. The one that was taken first, this characteristic, he was mature in life. He had been growing little by little in life. He was saved in life, learning to reign in life, and was mature in life. But I would emphasize the second reason. He was living in two realms at the same time. So outwardly, he is fulfilling all of his duties on his job. And surely, as a God man, he would be doing it the best he can in a faithful, diligent way, but inwardly, 
in his spirit, he's simultaneously living in an invisible, mystical, divine realm where inwardly he's in contact with the Lord moment by moment. And the same with the two sisters. They both were engaged in ordinary things, grinding another day, grinding out the grain, preparing to cook the meals, whatever it is. But one of those sisters was mature in life. And that sister was living in two realms at the same time. And because the brother, the overcomer, the sister, the overcomer, were living in these two realms, as I mentioned, I think it's somewhat clear, they could inwardly respond to any prompting from the Lord's Spirit within them. We're not told in the word what will happen, what will take place. The Lord just said, you need to watch. You need to be alert, spiritually speaking. There will be no outward sign that, oh, it's rapture time, no voice from the heavens, it's rapture time. No, it'll be something inward, not at all audible, it was silent. But these were ready, and the others were not. Now, this is the Lord's own direct speaking to us. What could be more direct than this? And he's speaking to us in the Gospel of Matthew concerning the reality of the kingdom of the heavens and the coming of the manifestation of the kingdom of the heavens in the millennium. The age is turning. And then he made such a clear statement to us what it will be like as it was in the days of Noah. And I have reason to believe what your view of this is, that's your personal view. I won't touch it. It has to be, it will get much worse if we're not really in those days yet. It will intensify. But we are still here. We still have to live a normal, practical, daily human life. We have to work. We have to take care of our family. On and on it goes. But inwardly, certain ones will be ready and they will be responsive to the rapture call. And then I would just add this. I sincerely believe that if not all, the vast majority of the saints in this meeting right now, I see some of you, one well into middle age, but not, not an octogenarian yet. Others are younger. I believe the vast majority will be living on the earth to the end, to the end of this age. And I have a burden from the Lord to alert you and to encourage you and to, as much as I can, to supply you with the word of truth with the way for us to learn to live in these two realms. That we would mature in life and be rapture 
ready. And so that is the burden that underlies this general subject that I'll read again, living in the divine and mystical realm of the compound spirit, not visiting, living, and to, to speak the, op, the obvious, living is something we do nonstop from the time we we're born until the end. It's not sometimes, it's not most of the time, it's all the time. Living in this divine and mystical realm, while we are at the same time living on the earth where we are, in the dwelling place that we have, doing the work that is our responsibility, taking care of our health, taking care of our family, being normal human beings, but God-man human beings. But inwardly, we're simultaneously, I say again, in this divine and mystical realm. Now I want to emphasize the word realm as we come to the subject of message one, the vision of the divine and mystical realm. We need to realize something. And that is in John chapter 15, when the Lord makes it very clear, teaching us, he said, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. And you are the branches, you're part of the vine. We're organically connected. Then he said, abide in me and I will abide in you. When we are abiding in Christ, that is living in Christ, we are not only living in the most wonderful person in the universe, the glorified, resurrected, ascended, enthroned God-man Jesus, we are in Christ as a realm. This is the realm of the all-inclusive Christ, the realm of the kingdom of Christ. We have to realize everyone on the earth is living in a realm from the time they were born. No, an infant has no awareness, but as they learn and they recognize, oh, who are these big people here? I hope the first word is mommy. They're paying the biggest price than daddy. And then the little one realizes, I'm part of a, I'm part of a family. And then they find out, I live in a big city. And this city is in part of the United States. And part in the United States is part of the whole earth. I just wonder, I sincerely wonder, and let's just focus on us. We have a loving concern for all the believers. The Lord bears witness to this. I just wonder how many of the beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord's recovery realize they are in a realm. They've been born into the kingdom of God as a realm of life. And everyone who was in, either in the flesh or unsaved is living in the world as a realm. 
There's no way, there's no alternative. And so these living overcomers, the brother and the sister who were raptured, they're living in both realms. Their body is still in the old creation. It's still a body of sin and a body of death until they're transfigured and glorified. But they're not like the ungodly. Inwardly, they're a different kind of being. They're a child of God, becoming a son of God, a God-man. With Christ making his home in their heart. And they're learning to live in him. We need to realize this Christ is a realm. And now we have a term to define this realm, the divine and mystical realm. Well, the word divine indicates this must have something to do with God. And mystical means not that we have mystical experiences like some unusual people, they're carried away into some kind of divine realm, they think. No, here the word mystical refers to a reality that we cannot touch by our senses, by anything physical. We can't feel it. We can't touch it, can't see it, can't hear it can't smell it. And atheist scientists, they just say, with no ground to support, there's only the material universe. That's all there is. Well, they're in for a shock. There is a mystical realm. And this realm is beyond the human mind to fully understand. We can somehow hold on to the thought. There is this mystical realm. It's mysterious. It's spiritual. But when it's revealed to us, we realize, now get ready for this, this divine and mystical realm is God himself. The triune God himself, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Sometimes, even a number of times, I just thought for a few minutes, then I just, too hard to think about it again. How big is this universe? It's just immeasurable. How many more than thousands of light years. Why is it so immense? And I just wonder, it's a kind of sign of the infinite God. He's immeasurable. And so our God, the true and living God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, all three are God. All three are eternal. All three live at the same time. And all three live in one another, co inhering The Father is in the Son and in the Spirit. The Son is in the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit is in the Son and in the Father. And so this triune God himself is a realm. And we have entered the kingdom of God as a realm of life. And this kingdom is a realm which is God himself, but in a particular way. Now, what is that particular way? I've just been trying to say that the eternal triune God 
himself is a divine and mystical realm. We cannot enter into this realm because this is the realm of the Godhead. We cannot enter into the Godhead, be part of the Godhead. And so that there's four in one, that would be dreadful her heretical teaching. But something happened because God wants us to live together with us in the same realm. So God came in Christ to be a God-man, the triune God-man, who lived a sinless human life, fulfilling God's purpose personally. Then he died an all-inclusive death for our redemption and to deal with all the negative things in the universe and to release the divine life. Then in his resurrection, for this humanity, he became the firstborn son of God. And now in resurrection, he's free from space and time. He is omnipresent. And also he became the life-giving spirit. And for those who believe into him, who believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead and confess Jesus Christ is Lord. The all-inclusive Christ as a life-giving spirit entered into us. So now he is one with our spirit. We have a person living in us, making his home in our heart. This was the first step, we could say, of our, the way being open for us to enter into the divine and mystical realm of the compound spirit. <clears throat> I'll explain that a little later. So in the first part of the Gospel of John, the word became flesh and lived among us. Then he died and was resurrected. But he told us in the verses we read in John 14 that I am the way, the way to the Father. It's good for you that I go away. When I go away, I will come to you as another comforter, the Spirit. And then he spoke, verse 20, in that day, the day of his resurrection, you will know that I am in the Father. You will know that you are in me. You will know that I am in you. Let's consider the first two points. You will know that I am in the Father. He has returned to the Father. But then he said, you are in me. So right now, dear saints, I mean, right this very moment, I'm not just sitting in a chair in an upstairs bedroom in our rented house. I am also in Christ the Son, in the Father, because he's in the Father and we are in him, that means by being in him, we are in the Father. And then the Lord went on to say, and I am in you. But in that same chapter, he said, you should know, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. So the Son is in the Father, we are in the Son, we are in the Father. The Son is in us, the Father is in the Son, therefore the Father in the Son is in us. Now, this resurrected Christ, 
the all-inclusive life-giving spirit. This is the realm that's divine and mystical that we are to live in. We are in the processed and consummated triune God as a realm. And when we are truly in our spirit, and are governed by the vision, the subject of message one, we realize I'm not only in part of my being, in my regenerated spirit, I'm not only in Christ personally, I'm in an immeasurable realm. I'm in the kingdom of God as the realm of the divine life. I'm in the divine and mystical realm of the compound spirit. And we read the verses from Exodus about the ointment, the compound ointment typifying the spirit of God as a result of Christ's resurrection, having many elements added to the spirit of God to be the all-inclusive compound spirit. And when we are in our spirit, we're not only in the spirit, we are now living in an immeasurable realm, all of us. And I refer back to that brother working on his job and was raptured. That sister grinding out at the mill, she was raptured because inwardly in their mingled spirit, they were not only contacting the Lord who is with their spirit, they were living in this vast realm. And we will see in messages two and three in this realm is everything we need effortlessly. It's all ours. Suppose somehow another nation, a very large country, somehow was now on the earth. And the people who live there they're told, look, everything you need in this realm is provided you. If you need medical care, you don't need insurance. Everything is here. All of the food supply, whatever you need, just stay here. Well, how many people, maybe everybody on the earth would want to, oh, we won't just try to sneak in the border of the United States. We like to be there. Well, that's an imaginary realm. I'm trying to make a point. There is this vast, immeasurable, eternal realm of the process and consummated triune God in Christ, who is in us as the life-giving spirit. And this spirit is the compound spirit. And when we're in this spirit, we're not only in Christ the person, we are in this realm. And those living overcomers, I mention again and again, they are living inwardly in this realm. And so while they're going through their human life, no matter what their situation is, no matter what their circumstances are, no matter what has been happening in their life, whether it's joyful or heartbreaking, they are learning to live in this realm. And the process and consummated triune God, who is the realm, 
He knows moment by moment what we need, what we need right now. You need resurrection life. You need forbearance. You need boldness with God mentioned by the Apostle John in his first epistle. You need grace. You need mercy because of what happened. You need assurance. You need my kindness. We don't even have to know to ask, what do I need? Most of the time, I don't know what I need, really. But in this realm, it flows instantaneously to us because we're here. And so that brother, whatever kind of work he had, if he is a welder, a mechanic, a carpenter, he's concentrating on his labor. He has skill. He's been trained. He earns his living. He does a good job. Someone else may be a surgeon. And he's operating on someone for several hours. His whole being, practically speaking, has to be focused. But both of these brothers are not limited to the outer realm, the physical realm. Because inwardly, and I'll tell you why in a minute they're able to do this, they're living in another realm at the same time. And so a lot can happen. Inwardly, you can contact the Lord and inwardly pray. Inwardly, you might sing. The Lord can contact you. <clears throat> dispense himself into you in a particular way. To supply you. Whatever it is. And this is now becoming your way of living. And you respond. The intuition in your spirit realizes this is from the Lord. The fellowship function of your spirit keeps you in touch. And then now comes this prompting. Rapture. And you're gone. This is going to happen. Revelation 14 will be fulfilled. And the living overcomers will be raptured. And then the great tribulation will begin. And the other brother in the field, the other sister grinding, and all those like them will live on the earth during that time of trial. Something the earth has never seen before. And at the very end, finally, they will be taken up to the Lord. So now, this is not simply an opening word. This is a major part of the, the message itself. The outline is only one page for a reason. That we would just sense the underlying burden of this. It's not just to dive into some high truth. But we need a vision of the divine and mystical realm. And because we love one another and shepherd one another and serve one another, there are many things we can do for one another. But I can't breathe for you. I can't take in food for you. I cannot say on behalf of a married brother to his wife, I love you. I can't do that. Only to my dear one. And I cannot see for you. I cannot. 
And Brother Ni nee and Brother Lee could not see for us. But they ministered from the word, the vision, the vision of something. And that this vision is for all of us to see, not just for the apostles, not just for the ministers of the age, Brother Ni nee and Brother Lee, but for all of us. But we need to avoid a mistake that I think brothers make more often than sisters do. We may think, because I understand the concept, because I'm clear about the doctrine, that means I have the vision, I see it. I remember way back in 1969, Brother Lee gave a message based upon the book of Revelation, where the Apostle John was describing what he saw. And he saw the new Jerusalem coming down. He saw the devil, Satan, be cast into the lake of fire. These were visions. And after the meeting, I remember, I was just barely 30 years old, only been in the recovery for three years, quite a beginner still. These brothers were so excited. They said, do you see it? Yes, I see it. You, me too, I see it. But I couldn't say, I see it. And to be honest, I didn't think they saw it. They're misleading themselves. So early the next morning, when I was going on the freeway to, to drive to my teaching job at a high school, I prayed simply about this. Lord, I need to see the vision that the devil's in the lake of fire. I need to see this. I agree with Brother Lee's teaching, but he saw it. It was a vision for Brother Lee as it was for the Apostle John. Lord, show me. And then I went into my class. And all the classes except one were exceedingly challenging with the most difficult kids in the school because it was kind of special education. And there's one fellow, I can never forget his name because it was Ronald. So I remember his name. And he was exceedingly an unusual person when he would act up. And he was sitting in the back of the room in a corner and he was just carrying on like this. And so I left my desk and walked over to him to speak as from teacher to student. And I looked at him and this is what I felt to say. Satan, you are in the lake of fire. And then there was an answer. No, I'm not. Then I said, yes, you are. Because there is a demon there. And then the enemy said, who told you? Then I said, John saw you. I received a message about this. And now I see it. And I rebuke you. I can sincerely say, although that vision needs to be enlarged and deepened, it's not a doctrine. Revelation 19.7, the vision, the bride has made herself ready. Revelation 21, 9 through 11, come here, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And John saw the new Jerusalem, a vision. Please, dear ones, don't rob yourself by just being assured Oh, I, I read this book. I heard those messages. 
25 years ago. That's that those facts are correct. Before the meeting, part of my prayer with the brothers was that we would be poor in spirit, pure in heart. And now the word vision, there are three elements or aspects of a vision. Okay, I'm not mentioning the aspects yet, a vision involves an extraordinary scene. If you would go to the Grand Canyon for the first time and are standing near the ledge, you could say, what a sight. I have a view of almost the entire Grand Canyon. This is like a vision. But if you saw a cricket hopping around by your foot, you wouldn't say, I just saw a vision of a cricket. That's not an extraordinary scene. And so a vision has three elements. First is revelation, which means, to be precise, the lifting of the veil. And we may not know it, we have veils covering our mind, covering our heart. We may not know it until they're lifted. And then we realize my, my opinions, my feelings, my culture, my all this, these are veils. Now the veils are lifted. That's step one. And then the next element is light. We need light to shine in us. The true light shining as John emphasized. The light is shining in our being. We are opening our whole being to the Lord. And right now we need to be. Lord, I open my being as wide as I can, as deep as I can. Shine, Lord. I need light. God is light. But then the third step, the third element is sight. The eyes of our heart need to be anointed. They need to be enlightened. And then inwardly, we can see. Only the Lord knows that there are exceptions to what I'm about to say, but I believe the vast majority of us in our life history, in the Lord's recovery, we see vision little by little. It enlarges. It expands. We, we see more. I cannot deny that there's a vision in me of the divine and mystical realm. But when I read the Gospel of John, the mystical gospel, when I read an epistle like Ephesians, I realize I don't have a vision the way the apostles did. Lord, I need more. And when I read the ministry, Study the ministry of Brother Nee and Brother Lee, I realize I see something, but I don't see as much as they do. Lord, I need more. This is to be poor in spirit. So we need a vision of the divine and mystical realm. And then the vision opens the way for us to begin to live here. And it'll give us the desire, the longing, the yearning to live here. But if it's only a thought, and if it's only a momentary kind of inspiring of our emotion, by late 
next Monday afternoon, it'll be gone. And there'll be no way to live in the two realms simultaneously because visions govern. Visions have authority. That's why Paul could say in Acts 26, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. It, it governs us, it directs us, it energizes us, it protects us. It's of tremendous significance. We need to pray for this. Paul in prison prayed for us that the Father would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of him, the eyes of our heart being enlightened. When was the last time you prayed for this, for yourself and for others? Now points one, two, and three are very helpful quotations from Brother Lee's ministry, Roman number one. Never underestimate the value of seeing a proper view of a certain matter. The view changes us. It affects our entire being. A lot has happened in my life since 1969 until now, 53 years later, for that vision that the devil has been cast into the lake of fire remains. And from time to time, especially when I'm praying with a companion, the closest companion, and we have to deal with the enemy, we can remind him, we are the new Jerusalem. We are the bride of the, re the redeeming Christ. You are in the lake of fire. We rebuke you. Go where you belong. And he knows that we see, and he must listen, because we're not in ourselves. We're speaking in the name of the Lord Jesus, the one who conquered the enemy. So it affects our entire being. I mean it, our entire being. Every aspect. Through all the stages of human life, it affected me when I was in my 30s, still a kind of a younger adult. And then went into middle age, another stage. The whole family's in another situation. And then eventually I had to say farewell to middle age. I asked one brother doctor who's a specialist in taking care of elderly people. I said, at what age did someone become elderly? He said, he thought, he said 75. Well, 75 is history to me. So now I'm in another stage. But that vision and other visions are upholding me dear saints. They're energizing me. They're strengthening me. They enable me to go on no matter what is happening. Two, all the saints in the Lord's recovery need to have a clear view concerning the physical realm and the mystical realm. Okay? All the saints not just some brothers who give messages, not just leading ones and elders, not just the minority of the young adults <clears throat> that go to a full-time training, not just the full-time serving ones. All the saints need to have a clear view concerning the physical realm and the mystical realm. And while I'm saying this inwardly, I feel I can, I can open this up. Inwardly, 
I'm praying. I'm praying inwardly while I'm speaking this. That you will sense the need for this personally. You don't say, Brother Ron said, I have a need. But I have a need. Like a brother saying, I need a wife. It's not good for me to be alone. Someone else says, I need a job, a proper job to support my family. I need to eat healthy food. I need to exercise for my health. I need to know how to take care of my growing children. This is not just a word you're saying. This comes from your heart. And we cannot manufacture this, but may the Lord put in this feeling. I need to have a clear vision concerning the physical realm and the mystical realm. I pray for this. The Lord will hear. He will answer. Three. You need to enter into a realm. A sphere. A kingdom which is much higher than the realm you are in now. This higher realm is the mystical realm of Christ's heavenly ministry. And that quotation along with point two are from the book, The Divine and Mystical Realm. That, that, that book is composed of messages spoken to a gathering of brotherly's co-workers in the spring of 1996 i was there i'm just a brother in the church and not an elder but there were elders there and co-workers and brotherly was speaking to us you need to enter into a realm a sphere a kingdom which is much higher than the realm you are in now. He was talking to us, telling us, you need to enter into a realm much higher than the realm all of you brothers are in right now. He knew where we were. And we, then I spontaneously realized Brother Lee is in this other realm, and he's ministering to us. I could never forget that. And so we need not only to have a clear view, we need to enter how to be in. And then we realize we're in the realm of Christ's heavenly ministry. All that he is doing at this present moment in his heavenly ministry is being transmitted, being dispensed into us. If we in our spirit are in the same realm, he's shepherding us. He's applying the heavenly supply to us. He's fighting for us, interceding for us, ministering heaven into us. But we need to be in the realm where this is taking place. Now, Roman numeral four, the triune God himself is a divine and mystical realm. I said a certain amount about this. In the first part of the message, this is the triune God in his Godhead, is a divine and mystical realm. Point A the three of the divine trinity are self existing, ever existing, coexisting, and co inhering. And as such, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are a divine and mystical realm. 
So this is the triune God in the Godhead. All three are self-existing. They've always existed. All three are ever existing. They will never cease. All three are coexisting. We live together at the same time. All three are co-inhering. We are dwelling in one another mutually. As a result, this triune God is a divine and mystical realm. I say again, we cannot enter into this realm. This is the God head. This brings us to point B. The divine and mystical realm into which we may enter is the divine and mystical realm of the consummated spirit and the pneumatic Christ. So this is the triune God in Christ passing through the process of incarnation, God men living, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. So on the day of his resurrection, this wonderful one appeared to his disciples and breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, the all-inclusive life-giving spirit. And now this realm enters into you as the spirit. And then abide in me now, live in this realm. And what is in this realm will become real to you day by day. So this is a realm that has a number of, quote, complications, in quotes, all of which are blessings for us to experience and enjoy. Well, what did Brother Lee mean by this word complications in quotes? Well, the triune God in the Godhead is not processed and consummated. That took place in God's economy. As the result of which he became this all-inclusive indwelling spirit as the realm in which we are. And the complications mean every aspect of the compound spirit, all the attributes of God, all the human virtues, every aspect of Christ living as Jesus, the God man on the earth, all the aspects of Christ's crucifixion, all the aspects of his resurrection and ascension, his enthronement, all that's here, they're called complications because there's so many innumerable aspects of it. The Godhead is simple. It's just the Father, Son, and Spirit. The triune God doesn't need to be processed for him to be the triune God in the Godhead, to be the realm divine and mystical, but for us to be the enterable divine and mystical realm, God became a man. And now humanity is involved. And when the Lord Jesus was resurrected, his humanity was uplifted into the sonship. He was the son of God in a second way. And now at the end of Matthew, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to the son of man. Right now there's a God man, Jesus on the throne, who's the Lord of the whole universe. And now all that he is, all that he has accomplished is part of this realm. And we just live here and the Lord knows you need this, you need that. You need to go here and there and 
sing this and pray this and read this and learn this and experience this and enjoy this. For instance, earlier today, I pre-recorded a message for another conference. And the second half of that message was about the good land, <clears throat> the land of Canaan, typifying the all-inclusive Christ. And that may be 18 or more times, at least, the Old Testament speaks of a land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, the milk and honey, the vegetable life and the animal life, typifying Christ's regenerating life and redeeming life. They're all mingled together to be a land flowing of milk and honey. And it's so sweet to have the milk and honey flowing in us. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And there's a verse in Song of Songs chapter six where the the Lord says to his beloved, from your lips, honey is dripping. In your tongue, there's milk and honey. And I mentioned that, you know, that book begins and ends with a kiss. Chapter one, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Oh, this is divine romance. He kissed his beloved. Surely, very sweet, endearing, affectionate. But once she has matured to become his duplication, the Shulamite, in chapter 8, she's just longing to be raptured, to have her body transfigured. She says, if I see you outside, meaning outside of the body of my old creation, I will kiss you. I just wonder, oh, I just wonder with a smile in my heart what it will be like when bride and bridegroom meet. Now, I don't want to hear you tell me because they get to see you in the new heaven and the new earth. I want to be there with all of you. When the bride and the bridegroom come together, I can't believe he would say, hello. How do you do? I am uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we're engaged to be married. And your name again? Oh, okay. Then uh, we shake hands. I'm not going to try to guess. But Song of Songs gives us a picture. This truly is a divine romance. And we want to be prepared to live forever in this divine and mystical realm. Inwardly, the overcomers reigning on the earth, they will be in this realm. Then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And for eternity, we'll be living in a divine and mystical realm. I don't want to miss the opportunity of my lifetime. I don't want to miss the reward of the kingdom age. We want to learn to live here now. See, the compound spirit is the divine and mystical realm. And we should learn to live in this realm. And you have 1 John 2, 20 and 27 about the anointing. And especially verse 27, the anointing teaches us to abide in him. We all have Christ as the spirit functioning in us as the compound spirit to be the ointment teaching us. So we should just offer a simple prayer. But I want to learn to live in this realm. If I were to move permanently to Japan, I visited there many times. If I'm going to live there permanently, 
I need to learn how to live here. I'm not a tourist, I'm not a visitor. And so, Lord, first of all, I got to realize I'm in this realm and I want to stay here, I want to live here, but I don't know what to do, how to live here. And the Lord might say, I'm aware of that. You're a learner, I'm the teacher. I'll guide you step by step. And now the last section, in maybe less than 10 minutes, this will give you ample time, please listen carefully, to complete the message by a confirming word and a testimony of what you heard, what you saw, what touched you, what enlightened you, what helped you. And then when many of you, I hope a few dozen, will testify, and I can say in peace, now the message has been completed because it's a body matter. Five, in the divine and mystical realm of the compound spirit, we have whatever we need. Even if we don't know we need it, we have it. And because we're living here, and we're open to the Lord's dispensing, the needs are met. And so now we have the sub points giving us some light concerning what's in the compound spirit. A, we have God signified by the olive oil. There's a time when I, I realized I need God as God. And many of us have been praying for the dear saints in Ukraine. Yes, they need the Lord. They need resurrection life. They need shepherding. But they need God, what only God can do. But God is in this realm. B, we have the triune God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, signified by the three units of measure of the four spices. There is a certain matter that has been on my heart heavily for almost 25 years. And I pray maybe thousands of times, and other dear saints have prayed even more. You count them all together. But recently I had the sense, it's been very good to pray for the Lord. But now I need to have fellowship with the Father. First John 1, 3. The Apostle John says, we're writing to you that you may have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And there are times when the Father wants us to talk to him as a child. I need a Father, not just a Savior, not just a Lord. I need a Father. The Father knows what we need. The Lord taught us to pray to the Father. Father, give us Please give me my daily bread, what I need to live. Father, deliver me from the evil one. And of course, we need the Son and the Spirit. See, we have the humanity of Jesus signified by the four spices of the plant life. So there's something mysterious here, but real. We know the high peak of the divine revelation. God became man to make man God, the children of God, the same as God in life and nature, but not in the Godhead and not as an object of worship. But the more we become the same as God in life and nature as God men, the more we become 
Jesusly human. They have the humanity of Jesus to be an approachable brother or sister. We're God men. Christ is our meal offering. D, we have the mingling of divinity and humanity <clears throat> typified by the blending of the olive oil and the four spices. So now blend, mingling is taking place. And we have that song, mingle, mingle, hallelujah. Mingling is the way. And we grow by mingling. We mature through mingling. The body is built by mingling. And so here we participate in the mingling of divinity and humanity. And you're, you're a God man. And now this mingling is taking place in you. Effortlessly. By your living in this realm. The Lord decides, well, this is going to be a special mingling day. So we arrange the environment just suitable. And you open up, it's going to be a mingle, mingle day. More divine, more human, mingled together in you. Point E. We have the precious death of Christ signified by the flowing myrrh. Oh, the precious death. We're in the fellowship of his death, Paul says in Philippians 3. And all the benefits, all the effects of his death are applied to us. It's part of the compound spirit. It's an element in the realm. The Lord knows you need this. Just contact me. I will apply this aspect of my, my death to you. It's a blessing to you. It's a deliverance to you. Then F. Uh, then F. We have the sweetness and effectiveness of Christ's death. When I first heard Brother Lee speak about this compound spirit, and he said that the effectiveness of the cross is in the spirit. And I was enlightened and I was touched. Then I had an unusual experience a couple of days later that a brother I was close to and fellowshiped often with, with a, lot, a lot, he was asked to do something in the church and certainly he had that portion. But then I was shocked by what was going on in me. I was jealous. I had to tell myself, I'm jealous. And I thought, sorry to say, sisters, I didn't know men were jealous. That's just women who get jealous about other women. But I'm jealous. But what do I do about it? And then I had this kind of conversation with the Lord. I said, Brother Lee just gave us a message that the effectiveness of your death is in the compound spirit. And so I'm going to try. Lord, I pray, now you apply the effectiveness of your death that's in the compound spirit to my jealousy. And it was killed. It was gone. It happened. This was the experience of a beginner, a first grader in the elementary school of the divine economy and experiencing this. But you got to begin somewhere. And so this is real. Oh, and, and the sweetness of it, like the honey, the effectiveness of Christ's death, nothing can stand against it. The enemy is terrified by the effectiveness of Christ's death in us. It just eliminates every negative thing. But there's more ground in Christ to make his home in us. G, we have the precious resurrection of Christ signified by the sweet calamus. Oh, the, the precious resurrection life of Christ, the power of his resurrection. The one who told John in John chapter one, he said, I am the living one. I became dead and now I'm alive again forever and ever. 
and I have the keys of death and Hades. He told us, I am the resurrection and the life. Now we are in resurrection land. And the Lord may decide, oh, today it's going to be resurrection day for you. From beginning of the day to the end. Every, every turn you make, every contact with me, resurrection life. Resurrection endurance. Resurrection power. Just because you're in the realm of resurrection. And then the last point. H, we have the repelling power of Christ's resurrection. Signified by the Kasha. So what is sweet to us is repulsive to the enemy. We're just giving off this fragrance. He said, ah, I'm, I'm going to get out of here. This is repelling power. I can't stand to be in contact with someone like this. You people living in the divine and mystical realm. Well, go. Get out of here. Your place is a lake of fire. My land is the land of the compound spirit, the divine and mystical realm. This is my home. I'm learning to live here. I've never been happier in my life. I'm still learning. And I want to learn with my dear brothers and sisters until we all reach maturity and are raptured ready and are taken out of this mystical realm to be more and more forever in the divine and mystical realm. What a future we have. Thank the Lord. Glory be to God. Now, 20 minutes left for you. And I'm staying here with you. My turn to listen. Amen.